Welcome to Hub History, where we go far beyond the Freedom Trail to share our favorite stories from the history of Boston, the hub of the universe. This is episode 147, Dread Pirate Rachel. Hi, I'm Jake. This week, we're talking about Rachel Wall. She's remembered as the only woman pirate from Boston and as the last woman to be hanged in Massachusetts. Her highly publicized trial took place as America implemented its constitutional government. The state attorney general who prosecuted her had been a signer of the Declaration of Independence. A few weeks after the trial, the presiding judge became one of the first U.S. Supreme Court justices, and her defense attorney, who'd helped ratify that constitution, soon became the first U.S. attorney for Massachusetts under that constitution. Not only that, but her death warrant carried perhaps the most famous signature in U.S. history, that of Governor John Hancock. However, the fascinating true story of Rachel Wall's life, trial, and death is often obscured by legend. But before we uncover the truth about the Dread Pirate Rachel, it's time for this week's Boston Book Club selection and our upcoming historical event. Our pick for the Boston Book Club this week is a slim volume of memoir by Annie L. Burton, published in 1909. Called Memories of Childhood Slavery Days, it has an opening passage that can be off-putting for the modern reader, recalling happy, carefree childhood days on the plantation. However, the book is not the whitewashing that the first sentence indicates. Burton was enslaved on a plantation in Alabama, and her earliest memories were formed during the Civil War years. While she says that the whites were too preoccupied with the war to pay much attention to her and her playmates, Burton recalls whippings given for stealing enough food to last until the next ration day, wives being sold down the river when they didn't produce a child within a year of their wedding day, and lynchings in the town square. The arc of Burton's life after the war brought her to the Boston area multiple times, and it gives an insight into a time of transition for formerly enslaved people in both the South and the North. In 1879, she was visiting Memphis, and she happened to read a Help Wanted ad placed by a white Newton family in need of a cook. She answered the ad, got hired, and on June 15, 1879, she stepped off a train in Boston's Old Colony Station before making her way to the family's home in Newtonville. As we'll hear in a few minutes, the dread pirate Rachel Wall also spent time as a domestic servant in the Boston area, so it's interesting to contrast their experiences, which took place about a century apart. Annie Burton spent about five years working in the households of the Boston area's wealthy white residents, moving to Roxbury, Jamaica Plain, and eventually Wellesley. A death in the family took her back to the South, and at that time she moved to Jacksonville, Florida for a while, where she opened a restaurant and claims to have introduced Boston baked beans to the Southern palate. Eventually, she found her way back to Boston and opened a restaurant here, which she says was right across from the Providence Depot. The book ends abruptly in 1909 as she was getting ready to publish, when she describes opening a lodging house with her husband, but then losing money on it. It's an amazing account by an author who remembered the experience of being enslaved, took a chance by migrating to the North, and eventually thrived as an entrepreneur in our city. The book's available as a free download on the Internet Archive, and will include a link to buy a hard copy on Amazon. And for our upcoming event this week, I'm featuring a September 11th talk by Lori Rogers Stokes called, Who Are the Puritans? Who Did They Become? And What Do They Mean to Us Today? In the past, co-host Nikki and I have heard lectures by Dr. Roger Stokes about Puritan views on sex and marriage, debunking myths about the Puritans, and how the public statements of faith Puritan women made when they officially joined the church reveal their complex inner lives. I can't think of a better local speaker to explain who the Puritans were. The talk is part of the annual Charter Day celebration by the Partnership of Historic Bostons. The Partnership is a local group focusing on the historical relationship between Boston, Massachusetts and Boston, Lincolnshire. Charter Day is celebrated on September 7th, commemorating the day in 1630 when Boston, Dorchester, and Watertown were all officially named. The Partnership has a series of lectures and walking tours throughout September and October as part of the celebration, and you can find more about those at historicbostons.org. Here's how they describe this one. The Puritans were, in their own day, nothing. A small group with no political power, easily driven from their own land into an America dominated by other powers, both Native and European. Yet they became a lightning rod for later generations, representing all that is good and bad in the American story. We will trace who the Puritans were when they arrived here, who they became, 
and what they left for following generations. What did the Puritans want New England to be? What ideas did they bring with them, and what ideas did they develop as a result of their experiences here? The talk will be held in the RAB Lecture Hall at the Copley Branch of the Boston Public Library. It'll begin at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, September 11th. There's no admission fee, but they do require advanced registration, and you have to have a library card. Now, before we move on with the show, I want to say a big thank you to this week's sponsor, Liberty & Co. Liberty & Co. sells unique products inspired by the American Revolution, and many of them have themes tied to the historical events, locations, and people of Boston's past. There's a Green Dragon Tavern mug, t-shirts for Paul Revere's Bell Foundry and the Boston Massacre, and designs for the law practice of John Adams available as t-shirts, stickers, and magnets. Another unique product that Liberty & Co. offers is an exclusive Candles of the Revolution series. Experts say that the sense of smell is closely tied to memory, so imagine remembering the Boston Tea Party through a candle that smells just like black tea. Or put yourself in Abigail Adams' garden with a Peacefield candle that has a blooming wisteria scent. There's now free shipping on all orders, and you can get 20% off your order and help support the show when you shop at libertyand.co and use the discount code HUBHISTORY at checkout. That's L-I-B-E-R-T-Y-A-N-D dot C-O and use the discount code HUBHISTORY. And now it's time for this week's main topic. Our dread pirate, Rachel Wall, was condemned to die on October 8th, 1789. On her last night on this earth, she dictated her life story, last words, and dying confession to Boston's jailer and his assistant. It was very unusual for a woman to meet with the death penalty, so she begins by saying, Without doubt, the ever-curious public, but more especially those of a serious turn of mind, will be anxious to know every particular circumstance of the life and character of a person in my unhappy situation, but in a peculiar manner those relative to my birth and parentage. She says that she was born in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which is near Harrisburg, in 1760. Although she doesn't give her birth name, historical consensus tells us that it was Schmidt. She says that she had honest and reputable parents, as well as three brothers and two sisters. Her father was a farmer, who she describes as a very serious man who was a devout member of the Presbyterian Church. Along those lines, she says that her father always made it his constant practice to perform family prayers in his house every morning and evening and was very careful to call his children and family together every Sabbath day evening to hear the Holy Scriptures and other pious books read to them, each one being obliged, after reading was over, to give an answer to such questions in the assembly's catechism as were proposed to them. They gave me a good education and instructed me in the fundamental principles of the Christian religion, and taught me the fear of God, and if I had followed their good advice, I should never have come to this untimely fate. The simple country life simply didn't appeal to Rachel. Though she doesn't give an exact age, she says that she ran away from home for the first time when she was, quote, very young. After an unspecified period of time, she returned home, and her parents took her in. But, as the poet says, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen gay Paris? Rachel didn't stay down on the farm long, saying, I tarried with them but two years before I left them again, and have never seen them since. After those two years, a young man named George Wall caught her eye. She wrote in her confession, If I had never seen him, I should not have left my parents. But leave them she did, and she claims to have been legally wed to Wall, though I couldn't find a marriage record for them. Together, they moved to Philadelphia, where George took such work as he could find on the docks and fishing vessels. Before long, they moved to New York City, where they only lasted a few months. And then, finally, they moved to Boston. A 1998 book about woman pirates by Myra Weatherly gives the commonly accepted version of how the couple took to buccaneering. Soon, George went to sea on a fishing schooner, leaving Rachel. With George away, Rachel worked as a servant in a fine house in Boston and lived very contented. Two months later, George returned. Rachel reported that as soon as he came back, he enticed me to leave my service and take to bad company, from which I may date my ruin. Besides her husband, the bad company included George's five shipmates and their rowdy female companions. The sailors spent their earnings in less than a week. 
One night, while George and his friends were out late carousing, the fishing schooner sailed without them. With no prospects for making money, George suggested to his companions that they become pirates and get rich. During the Revolutionary War, all the men had served aboard privateers, capturing British ships, plundering them, and dividing the spoils with the government as part of the war effort. George Wall and his cronies knew that piracy in peacetime was a hanging offense. Still, they were unable to resist the temptation of a life of luxury. The sailors agreed with George's plan. Even Rachel accepted the invitation. The New England Historical Society's article about the couple and their pirate crew describes how Rachel used her femininity to lure unsuspecting sailors to their doom. The couple turned pirate in 1781. They stole a vessel, the Essex, and operated near the Isles of Shoals off the New Hampshire coast. They waited for rough weather and then disguised the Essex to look as if it had been damaged in the storm. Rachel called to passing ships for help, and when they docked to the Essex, the pirates stormed the ship and robbed it. It worked for a while. They robbed 12 ships of more than $12,000 in cash and plunder, and killed 24 sailors. Another book about women pirates, this one from 2008, says that the authorities would have believed that all these missing ships and sailors had gone down in summer storms. Then, it goes on to describe the ignoble end of this pirate crew. Ironically, George drowned in a hurricane, and Rachel returned to work as a Beacon Hill maid. That proved too quiet and underpaid a life for Rachel. She went back to robbery, sneaking into ships docked in Boston Harbor and stealing from sailors as they slept. But she was caught and tried not just for the robberies, but also for an onboard murder. In prison, she confessed all the facts about her life as a pirate. She was hanged on Boston Common on October 8, 1789 the last woman to be so punished. Some of the details of Rachel's days as a pirate vary from one account to the other, but the arc of the story remains basically the same. As you know, I like to quote from primary sources when I can, so after reading some popular accounts, I found a transcription of Rachel's confession in Last Words. I was immediately struck by the fact that she never mentions piracy in her confession. Digging a bit deeper, I discovered that the contemporary records of her trial and execution also never mentioned piracy. Rachel Wall, the famous so-called pirate, was hanged as a highway robber. Now I was skeptical. I kept digging, and I ended up stumbling across an essay written by Amy Berkeley that debunks the story of Rachel Wall as a pirate. She said, The first public mention of Wall's pirating career was in 1959, 170 years after her death when Piracy, Mutiny, and Murder was published by Edward Rowe Snow. Snow was a well-known historian and storyteller who made a name for himself in the mid-20th century, popularizing stories of pirates in New England maritime history. Writers such as Snow typically list their source as the Robert Treat Payne trial notes. This is a rather vague reference, as Payne's collection of papers is quite extensive. After reviewing Payne's trial minutes from 1785 to 1789 concerning Rachel Wall, it's clear that no mention is made of her involvement in piracy. Either the source has been cited incorrectly, or the tale of Rachel Wall is just that, a tale. As we've seen in previous episodes, most recently the story of the so-called smuggler's tunnels in the North End, Edward Rowe Snow too often blurred the line between historian and storyteller. His love of Boston Harbor and the Harbor Islands was contagious, and his colorful storytelling made him a darling of the media. Starting in the 1950s, Snow had a daily newspaper column in the Patriot Ledger, a weekly show on local radio, and he made lots of local TV appearances. And creating enough stories to fill all these outlets and make them engaging enough to keep an audience interested, Snow often resorted to just making stuff up. And that's what appears to have happened here. And yet, And yet, and yet, there is a lot of truth within the myth that we've been retelling so far. Rachel Schmidt was born in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. She married George Wall, and they moved to Philly and NYC before settling in Boston. And yes, Rachel Wall was the last woman to be executed in Massachusetts. She was condemned to hang on Boston Common on October 8, 1789. But as I just mentioned, the crime she was condemned for was highway robbery, not piracy. The true story of Rachel Wall is just as interesting as the legend of the pirate, 
So let's take a look at what really happened. So after Rachel and George Wall settled in Boston, it sounds like their marriage ran into some difficulties. In her confession, Rachel says that upon arriving in our city, he tarried with me some time and then went off, leaving me an entire stranger. During her husband's unexplained absence, Rachel started working as a domestic servant for families that could afford it. About this period, her confession says, I went to service and lived very contented and should have remained so had it not been for my husband, for as soon as he came back, he enticed me to leave my service and take to bad company, from which I may date my ruin. That's right, George came back, and when he did, he introduced Rachel to a life of crime, when she was about 25 years old. He didn't stick around for long, because she confesses, he went off again and left me, and where he is now, I know not. In an essay about the death penalty in Massachusetts in the two decades after we adopted our state constitution, historian Alan Rogers summarized the crime spree that resulted from George's return. According to Rachel, before he disappeared again, he entwined her in the sticky web of crime. Beginning in 1785, she claimed a string of successful robberies and but two unsuccessful criminal forays. While another woman pled guilty in the summer of 1785 to stealing goods from attorney Perez Morton Esquire. Side note that Perez Morton was a close friend of John Adams. He was an attorney who'd been active in revolutionary Boston, and he'd go on to a successful political career and serve as the state attorney general for over 20 years. The essay from Rogers continues, The court sentenced Wall to pay triple damages of 18 pounds to have 15 lashes laid on her bare back, and to pay court costs. Because she was unable to make payment, the court stipulated that her labor might be purchased for three years. Three years later to the day, Wall was back before the SJC. Together with two accomplices, Wall was arrested for housebreaking and theft. She pled guilty, and the court sentenced her to pay Lamuel Ludden £24 for the goods stolen, to sit on the gallows for one hour with a noose around her neck, and to be publicly whipped. Again, because Wall was penniless, the court announced that someone might purchase her labor for three years in exchange for paying her fine. Whipping and simulated execution were harsh punishments, but they were standard for the time. Under colonial law, there was a sort of three-strikes law for burglars and highway robbers. If any person shall commit burglary by breaking up any dwelling house, or shall rob any person in the field or highways, Such person so offending shall for the first offense be branded on the forehead with the letter B, and if he shall offend in the same kind a second time, he shall be branded as before, and also be severely whipped. And if he shall fall into the like offense the third time, he shall be put to death as incorrigible. However, by the 1780s, the new U.S. of A. was a free and democratic nation. So surely the punishment for simple burglary or robbery must have been more humane by then, right? Not so fast. Chapter 66 of the General Court's Acts of 1784 provides an act for the punishing and preventing of larcenies. The sentences for simple theft and for burglary were similar. When the Supreme Judicial Court found someone guilty of theft, the statute mandated that the offender shall for such offense be set upon the gallows for the space of one hour with a rope around his neck and one end thereof cast over the gallows and be severely whipped, not exceeding 39 stripes, and be further sentenced to pay treble the value of the article stolen to the party injured, and the same justices may further sentence him to make satisfaction to the person injured as aforesaid, by service as aforesaid, if he be unable to pay the same. So, for simple theft, they got mock execution, public whipping, and could be sold into servitude for a period of years to pay for damages. For either crime, a judge could choose a sentence of hard labor for up to 15 years. Repeat offenders could be branded in the face with a T for theft or a B for burglary. And repeat burglars could be sentenced to life at hard labor. Having been convicted of theft in 1785 and burglary in 1788, Rachel Wall experienced nearly all the punishments of the 1784 statute. Whipping, mock hanging, and penal servitude. For some reason, it wasn't enough to make her see the error of her ways. 
An article in the Independent Chronicle and Universal Advertiser of Boston on April 2, 1789, reported a shocking crime. A singular kind of robbery for this part of the world took place on Friday evening last. As a woman was walking alone, she was met by another woman, who seized hold of her and stopped her mouth with her handkerchief, and tore from her head her bonnet and cushion, after which she flung her down, took her shoes and buckles, and then fled. She was soon overtaken and committed to jail. The victim of this singular robbery was 17-year-old Margaret Bender. She'd been walking alone on a busy street in Boston, though the court records don't record exactly what street it was. They just say that the crime happened in the public highway, leaving Rachel vulnerable to a highway robbery charge. By this time, a sponsor had paid off Rachel Wall's fine from her previous theft, freeing her from penal servitude, and she was back at work as a domestic servant. Citing Robert Treat Payne's trial notes, Rogers describes how the two women crossed paths on March 27, 1789. About supper time, Margaret Bender was walking along a busy Boston street toward a friend's home. Apparently entering the street from an intersecting alley, a woman walked rapidly after Bender. From behind, the assailant tried to grab Bender's bonnet from her head, but failing to do so, hit the young woman in the face and stuffed a handkerchief in her mouth. Bender cried out for help. Colonel Thomas Dawes and his neighbor Charles Berry rushed into the street to help. Thomas Dawes was an architect who worked on Brattle Street Church, the Shirley Eustace House, and modifications to the old state house. Plus, he was a cousin of William Dawes, who was one of the riders who warned the countryside that the regulars were marching on Concord. Rogers continues, While Dawes helped Bender stem the blood flowing from her mouth, Barry chased after the assailant, shouting, Stop that woman! When he caught up with Wall, whom he believed to be the assailant, Barry took hold of her. He brought Wall to Bender, who said she appeared to be the same person who attacked her. Wall was arrested and hurried off to Boston jail. Wall would insist on her own innocence, writing in her confession, I had been at work all the preceding day and was on my way home in the evening without design to injure any person. In my way, I saw a bonnet in the street. What it was, I knew not until I was taken up. I never saw Miss Bender and was quite surprised when the crime was laid to my charge. The witnesses who swore against me are certainly mistaken. The case would hinge on Bender's testimony, and the law was clear that if the victim was a person of good character, their testimony was all that would be required for a conviction. There was apparently some lingering question about the nature of the assault as Bender described it, because even in the late 19th century, a newspaper account would say, Tradition in the case as generally believed is that the offense was one involving a quarrel between two women one of whom snatched the bonnet of the other. However, Margaret Bender was considered an upstanding woman from a good family, while Rachel Wall was a rootless stranger of low class and a repeat offender. Bender's account would always be believed over Wall's. Even in 1905, a family member wrote to the Boston Transcript defending Bender's virtue after they published a version of the story indicating a quarrel. The note said, Margaret Bender lived to the ripe age of 72, loved and respected by all. Recollections of her forbid the thought that the two women quarreled. My impression from what I have heard of the occurrence is that Margaret Bender was the victim of a sudden and unprovoked assault. The trial didn't take long. Since highway robbery was a capital charge, the case was tried before the Supreme Judicial Court of the Commonwealth. The prosecutor was Robert Treat Payne acting in his role as the first Attorney General of Massachusetts. Payne is best remembered as a member of the Second Continental Congress and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was also a serious legal scholar. When John Adams defended the British soldiers who were on trial for their roles in the 1770 Boston Massacre, Robert Treat Payne was the prosecutor. A year after Rachel Wall's case was decided, Payne would go on to serve as a judge on the state's highest court. In this case, Payne presented Rachel's prior criminal record for the jury, had Margaret Bender and nine other witnesses take the stand, and argued that highway robbery was the appropriate charge for a theft by force on a public street. Rachel's defense attorney was Christopher Gore, then just 31 years old but a rising star in legal circles in Boston. He'd been a member of the ratifying committee for the U.S. Constitution in Massachusetts, and a few months after this trial, he'd serve as the first U.S. attorney for Massachusetts. 
Still later, he'd serve as Massachusetts governor and a U.S. senator, and his home in Waltham is preserved as a historic site. Gore countered Payne's charge by saying that since Rachel didn't have the bonnet in her possession at the time when Charles Berry caught up with her, the most she could be charged with was assault with an attempt at robbery. This was an important distinction, because while highway robbery was a capital crime, attempted robbery could be punished with whipping, mock execution, a fine, or three years at hard labor, but not the gallows. The judge, William Cushing, was not convinced. He let the capital charge of highway robbery stand. Like Gore, Cushing would be called into federal service just a few months after this trial. The first federal government was being assembled under the new U.S. Constitution, and Cushing would serve as one of the original justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. Witness statements and evidence from the trial haven't been preserved, but we do have a record of the jury's sentence, reached on August 25, 1789. The document says, The jury, being sworn to speak the truth of and concerning the premises upon their oath, say that the said Rachel Wall is guilty. Attorney General Payne requested the death penalty, and Judge Cushing returned this sentence. It is considered by the court here that the said Rachel Wall be taken to the jail of the Commonwealth from whence she came, and from thence to the place of execution, and there be hanged by the neck until she be dead. On September 10th, Governor John Hancock signed Rachel Wall's death warrant, which ordered the Sheriff of Suffolk County that on Thursday the 8th day of October next, between the hours of 12 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, at the usual place of execution, you cause execution on the person of the said Rachel Wall to be done and performed in all things according to the form and effect of the said judgment, for which this shall be your sufficient warrant. I only got to read a transcript of the warrant, not the original document. But in my mind, John Hancock's signature is just as big on the warrant as it was on the Declaration of Independence. The verdict was handed down on August 25th, and her death warrant was signed on September 10th, so Rachel Wall had about a month in the Boston jail to reflect on her life and its imminent end. The result of that reflection was the life story and confession that we've quoted from before. While she continued to deny her guilt in the Capitol Highway robbery case, she admitted to a number of lesser charges, a few of which might explain how Edward Rowe Snow stretched the truth to create a pirate tale out of her life story. First, she relates her attempt to break her husband George out of jail during his brief return to Boston, using what's now an almost cartoonishly cliched method. Sometime about the year 1785, my husband being confined in the jail in this place, I had a mind to try an expedient to extricate him from his imprisonment which was to have a brick loaf baked, in which I contrived to enclose a number of tools, such as a saw, a file, etc., in order to assist him in making his escape, which was handed to him by the jailer in person, who little suspected such a trick was playing with him. However, it liked to have had the desired effect the crafty contriver intended, for by means of this stratagem the poor culprit Wall had busily employed himself with the implements that the kind helpmate in this curious manner conveyed to him, and had nearly effected his design before it was discovered. In Amy Berkeley's debunking of the pirate myth, she cites council minutes from Robert Treat Payne's papers to point out that two pirates were in fact held in the Boston jail in the summer of 1785. But their names were William Buckley and Belitha Taylor, not George or Rachel Wall. Her confession also describes two more incidents that I think are more likely to be the inspiration for Edward Rose Snow's pirate tale. In one of my nocturnal excursions, when the bright goddess Venus shined conspicuous and was the predominant planet among the heavenly bodies, sometime in the spring of 1787, I happened to go on board a ship lying at the Long Wharf in Boston. The captain's name I cannot recollect, but think he was a Frenchman. On my entering the cabin the door of which not being fastened, and finding the captain and mate asleep in their beds, I hunted about for plunder, and discovered under the captain's head a black silk handkerchief containing upwards of thirty pounds in gold crowns and small change, on which I immediately seized the booty, and decamped therewith as quick as possible, which money I spent freely in company as wicked as myself. At another time, I think it was the year 1788, I broke into a sloop, 
on board of which I was acquainted, and finding the captain and every hand on board asleep in the cabin and steerage, I looked round to see what I could help myself to, when I espied a silver watch hanging over the captain's head, which I pocketed. I also took a pair of silver buckles out of the captain's shoes. I likewise made free with a parcel of small change for pocket money to make myself merry among my evil companions. At least these two thefts took place on board ships, but it's quite a leap from there to a life of piracy luring unsuspecting sailors to their deaths among the Isles of Shoals. Rachel Wall's month of reflection was soon up. She closed her confession by thanking the judge in her case for assigning her an attorney, thanking her attorneys for arguing earnestly on her behalf, and by thanking the ministers of Boston for tending to her religious needs after she was condemned. Her last words are recorded as, And now, into the hands of Almighty God I commit my soul, relying on His mercy through the merits and mediation of my Redeemer, and die an unworthy member of the Presbyterian Church in the twenty-ninth year of my age. Her confession is printed on a single large page, what would have been known as a broadside, meant to be publicly posted. At the top of the sheet, there was a woodcut print illustrating Rachel's execution. It depicts what at first glance appears to be the framing of a house, a stick-built structure with four walls and a gable roof. The walls and rafters are open, and the whole thing's mounted on a frame with wagon wheels. This was the portable gallows that was wheeled out on Boston Common on October 8, 1789. By all accounts, it was near the corner of Tremont and Boylston. The picture also portrays three figures being hanged from a beam mounted on top of the rafters, while a crowd on the ground watches. The figure in the middle is pictured wearing a dress, meant to represent Rachel Wall, while two male figures on either end represent William Smith and William Dunnigan, a.k.a. William Dinefy, who were also executed as highway robbers that same day. The Suffolk County Sheriff sent this formal note to Governor John Hancock in response to Rachel's death warrant. In obedience to this precept to me directed, I remove the body of the within-named Rachel Wall from the jail and the place for confinement to the usual place of execution, where I hang the said Rachel Wall by the neck until she was dead. I therefore return this warrant fully satisfied. Joseph Henderson, Sheriff As Rachel Wall went to her death, the first president of the United States was planning the first presidential tour. George Washington had only been in office for about five months when he announced a trip to visit Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, the three New England states that had ratified the Constitution. Suck it, Rhode Island. He arrived in Boston on October 25th. It had been 13 years since George Washington led the Continental Army out of Boston after successfully ending the British occupation, and he was met with adoring crowds as he passed by the site of Rachel Wall's execution on his way to the old state house. The three people who were executed on October 8, 1789 were among the last to be executed for highway robbery in Massachusetts, and Rachel Wall was the last woman executed in the Commonwealth for any crime. In 1805, the sentence for highway robbery was changed to two years of solitary confinement, followed by life imprisonment at hard labor. In 1836, the statute was amended to give judges leeway in sentencing. For her part, one of Margaret Bender's granddaughters wrote this note to the Boston Transcript in 1905. It was said that my grandmother never ceased to deplore the fact that a life was forfeited on her account. To learn more about the life, death, and piratical legend of Rachel Wall, check out this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 147. We'll have a link to the full text of Rachel Wall's confession, as well as a 1905 study of her case by members of the Mass Historical Society that pulls together a number of primary sources. We'll also link to the two books about women pirates that we quoted as repeating the myth, and to Amy Berkeley's essay debunking the pirate myth. Plus, we'll link to the Acts of the Legislature from 1711, 1784, and 1805 that trace the evolution of our laws regarding robbery and theft. And, of course, we'll have links to information about our upcoming event and Annie Burton's Memories of Childhood Slavery Days, this week's Boston Book Club pick. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at podcast at hubhistory.com. You can call and leave a voicemail at 617-383-9255, and you might just hear your voice on the show. 
We are Hub History on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Or just go to hubhistory.com and click on the Contact Us link. While you're on the site, hit the subscribe link and be sure that you never miss an episode. If you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, please think about writing us a brief review. Or just tell a friend about us. That's all for now. We'll be back next week. 